I want to take a, a, uh, some time now just to explain what this consultation process is about. We, um, we looked at the three phases, this first consultation phase, then the exposure draft and the final guidance. So what's this first stage about? Uh, who should participate? Why? Um, what does this consultation process look like? What's in the consultation paper? And how practically should people respond? So first, let's look at who. Um, first point is that all of you here are the right people uh, and you should please plan to respond to the consultation. It's going to, the consultation paper will be issued in January and that's when the formal, 28th of January, that's when the formal consultation process will uh, open and the paper will be issued. So the types of people we're particularly keen to get feedback from are of course, uh, regulators, given their influence at country level. Uh, auditors, because they've often got a lot of technical uh, experience and exposure to lots of different NPO clients. Funders, as you've crucially mentioned, are really important, uh, influential stakeholders. So we want to hear um, maybe, so it could be Nigeria foundations and trusts, it could be donors that are homegrown in Nigeria, it could be the Nigeria offices of international donor organizations like Temitope. Um, so, but it's really crucial to have the, the Nigeria funder uh, angle. And then of course, MPOs, large and small, international, local, uh, finance managers, the treasurers, um, you absolutely the right people to, to respond. And if we look at why, well, without the input from people in Nigeria, the cultural context uh, in Nigeria might not be reflected and the needs and realities of stakeholders in Nigeria might or might not be reflected in the proposals that are put forward. So what we've really got here is an opportunity to shape the future, which I think is the title of this whole session really. Um, and future generations of Nigerians can look back and say, because you participated in the process, we've got something that works for us. Um, so it's a real chance to have an impact uh, for the future. And ultimately from a project level as well, the more people that contribute, the more credibility the project has. If we get contributions from, you know, a thousand people in 150 countries, that's good. We can take that to donors and say, look, what we're building here is based on this input from so many people from different uh, uh, parts of the world and different stakeholder groups. And it means it's harder for people to say, ah, that's a small thing, we're not interested. It, it increases the credibility and the adoption, which is crucial. So this, that's four really good reasons why uh, to, to participate in the consultation process next year. So what the consultation process is shaped by this document called the consultation paper. So it's still in the final stages of development and the PAG and the TAG have spent the last year looking at drafts and making changes and suggestions and changing the direction and guiding the content. So let's just have a look at how it's structured. So after the executive summary, uh, there's an introduction which sets out the objectives of the project, explains who should respond to the consultation paper and how it's just kind of short, essential reading. Then the bulk of the paper and all the questions that we're looking for your feedback on are in two main sections. That's part one and part two, and we'll look at those in a bit more depth shortly. Then there's some supplementary information that gives more context. Uh, and there's a, a, some of the annexes, for example, show how does IFRS have anything to say about this? What about the guidance in the UK or the New Zealand or existing standards, that they have any guidance on this particular issue. So that's all in the annexes, so you don't have to read it all. But if you're a technical person who wants to know, you can look it up. And then the glossary explains the meanings as intended for the consultation paper, because different terms might have different legal meanings in different contexts. And we want to engage with people who might, well, many people won't have English as their first language. We want to really just help um, make sure that there's clarity of meaning on terms that we've used. So that's the purpose of, of the glossary there. So just to give you a sort of overview of the questions that we'll be looking for your feedback on. So as I mentioned, there's these two parts. Part one 
is around sort of framework level issues like how to describe nonprofit organizations or who their stakeholders are. It's written in plain English and it's pitched to be accessible to a really broad audience of stakeholders interested in financial reporting, not just accountants. So part one is divided into chapters, five chapters, and each chapter presents a proposal and ends with a request for general matters for comment. So in other words, you're invited to comment on the general level matters presented in the chapter. So these questions take to, tend to take this form. Do you agree with the, what we've proposed? If not, why not? So in that sense, the question is open. There's a sort of, do you agree, yes, no, short form answer, but there's also that opportunity to share your opinions, some nuance, some, you know, all the richness of your experience and opinion can be shared as well. Then part two is about specific accounting issues, like when to recognize grant income, as Tamita Pei mentioned, or when to disclose gifts in kind and things like that. So it's also written in plain English, uh, but it's pitched to be accessible to a more technical audience with, who are familiar with accounting concepts and language. You don't need to be, you know, president of the of ICANN, but at least have a, an ability to engage with some of the uh, financial ideas. So in part two, each section uh, describes the issue and then presents alternative treatment. So there are about 10 uh, sections in part two. And then each section ends with a request for specific matters for comment. In other words, you're invited to comment on the specific matters presented in the section. And generally the question is formed, do you agree with the description of the issue? Have we described the problem properly? And have we presented the right alternatives? Is this something that we haven't even thought of? And then which alternative do you prefer and why? So there's a sort of straightforward kind of voting system. Here are four options that we've come up with that are, exist in uh, existing standards. What would be your preference? Would you prefer to defer income on the balance sheet until it's spent? Would you prefer to recognize income as it's receivable, grant income, depending on conditions and stipulations and what have for us? So it gives you the, the option to basically vote um, like that. So again, it's necessary to have read the section and you have to look at the alternatives before you can meaningfully submit a response. And what that does is it gives us as a project uh, structured responses which we can analyze. And we can al also analyze them by stakeholder group and by region and country uh, so that we get a really rich a set of feedback. So we've had a sense of the general shape. I just want to take a slightly deeper dive into each of the five chapters to give you a taste. And I should mention that the consultation paper is still not final. So what I'm presenting here is what I believe will be in the final, but in case there's something different in the finished version, uh, I've, I've uh, covered my back here. So, um, oh, Francis is coming back. Hoping he can speak to us later. So um, part one, chapter one of the consultation paper is all about the question of which organizations would be considered NPOs for the purpose of this guidance. Um, we talked about NGOs, but it's more complicated than that, isn't it? What about churches? What about um, social enterprises? What about um, an NPO that has an income generating thing that does profit. You know, there's quite a lot of grey areas around the outside. So what this uh, chapter does is it presents a proposal of broad characteristics and it says that here's four characteristics. If your organisation broadly matches these characteristics, then this guidance will be relevant. Okay, if you have three but not four, well, some of the guidance won't be relevant for you, but maybe other aspects will. So it kind of presents some broad characteristics. And then the question is, do you agree with these broad characteristics? Are they the right ones? If not, why not? What alternative characteristics would you propose and why? So that's, that's chapter one, all about what, what do we mean by NPOs? Who would this guidance actually be applicable to? Um, in, in part one, chapter two of the consultation paper, it's all about the external stakeholders. 
or the, these users of the nonprofit financial reports? What information do they need? What do they actually want to know? And again, we present a proposal. Do you agree that their information needs are A, B, C, D? And I think what we've got here is uh, information about the MPO's achievement of objectives, about economy efficiency, about compliance with restrictions and regulations, and longer term financial health, sustainability, reserves maybe. So are those the right things? Uh, do you agree? If not, why not? What alternative areas would you propose and why? So you can put your hat on as a user and say, well, for me as a user, this is what I would love to find out from the financial statements. And if that's not included there, you've got the space to, to share that. So part three is all about aspects of the guidance itself. It presents some proposals. Um, one of the questions is about um, the guidance being accrual based. So we are proposing accrual based uh, uh, guidance rather than cash based. Um, but we understand that there will be challenges associated with that potentially. So it's really, the question is what, uh, it, what challenges, if any, do you foresee with the guidance being accrual based? And what other approach or approaches might meet the guidance objectives and explain why? Um, we make the case why we think it's accrual based. We put advantage, pros and cons of different options that we've considered. This has been something that's really engaged the PAG especially because some donors require cash basis reporting. And so again, part of this conversation about conflicts, um, what would give us valuable information for different types of users and why? So that is a really key chapter. And then the other thing in this chapter is about the content of the narrative report, which somebody else mentioned as being a really key part. So uh, part one, chapter four, about existing financial reporting frameworks and we firstly we make the case that the guidance really must draw on an existing framework it can't start with an entirely blank sheet of paper in terms of credibility in terms of achieving the project goal in time in terms of connection with other professional accountancy organizations it just does make sense so the three existing international frameworks are IFRS, IPSAS and IFRS for SME so what we've done is none of them are perfect. None of them are the ideal starting point. They're written for governments or for for-profit businesses. Um, some of them are large, some of them are smaller, some of them are updated all the time, some of them are more stable over time. So we've set out some criteria that we think would be the, will help us choose which is the, the best out of three options, none of which is perfect. <laughs> um, and then ask the question, agree with these criteria uh, and, the, and the way we've assessed against them and if not what other criteria should we think about that are important and why and then the final chapter which is the kind of culmination of where it's all been leading we propose a model um, which is basically to start with the IFRS for SME because it's more targeted at small and medium uh, it's um, not revised so often it's shorter not that it's perfect, but it seems to be the best of the three according to our understanding and analysis. So the question, the crucial question, do you agree with the model that we're, that's proposed? If not, what alternative do you suggest? We also propose to pick from full FRS, IPSAS and other national standards to help us plug the gaps for the unique, uh, unique aspects for nonprofit accounting that aren't covered in IFRS SME. So do you have any concerns about this? What are they, do you agree with the model? So you've got that chance to share your opinion about what we're proposing. So that's a sort of snapshot of the consultation part one. Five chapters with two to four questions per chapter. I've just given you a sort of sample of those questions. And I hope that gives you a feel. And I hope you have some strong opinions and you think, actually, I really want it this way or that way, which is great. Um, we want to we want to hear those opinions. That's what this is all about. Okay, so that was part one. This is now part two, um, which is looking at unique issues that are unique to the nonprofit sector. It's kind of the, the gaps that IFRS or IFRS for SME doesn't tell us what to do. So these are the, the specific uh, sector specific accounting issues. So Again, this, this is the list as per this consultation paper as it is now. Um, 
And this list has been decided, and part of the, the beginning actually of this section two says, how have we arrived at this list? What's been the process for identifying which issues uh, should be covered? So we've got issues like, you know, the financial statement presentation. How do we show uh, financial performance? Do we do fund accounting with columns like in the UK? Do we do, do we stop at the profit line or we do, do a um, retained comprehensive income type thing? There's lots of options. They're all, you know, suggested there. Vertical or horizontal balance sheet. There's lots of different options. Then there's something about narrative reporting. So if it is to be included, what should it cover? Um, how should we classify expenses? Should it be by nature, like salaries, transport, uh, rent, etc.? Should it be by function? Um, if it's by function, which functions? Uh, the UK has, you know, charitable expenditure, which is again, that's a word that isn't very internationally available, uh, but program admin and fundraising, or something else. What is a good, meaningful way to classify expenses on the face of the financial statements? And then uh, income recognition, and that would include grants uh, and non-exchange transactions and also these in-kind donations. Fundraising costs, how to account for grants made. When do you expense it? Do you expense it when it's committed? Do you expense it when it's paid? Or do you expense it when they've accounted for it? Everybody does their own thing because there's no guidance. So let's uh, get some agreement. What about these assets? Uh, to pay the senior, do we expense them, which is what the donors require? Should we capitalize them, even if they're donor funded? Uh, what if they don't generate revenue? The whole basis for capitalizing assets in IFRS is because they generate revenue, but our assets are held to achieve a social purpose. It's an entirely different premise. So what changes do we need uh, that make it relevant for us? Then inventory, what if we've got medical supplies or, I don't know, uh, relief supplies, who knows, all sorts of different things that you might uh, use or, or distribute as part of your activities and you've got them held at the year end. Normally we have to value at the lower of cost and net realizable value, but if you're not going to sell them, does that mean they have no value? Well, you know, all those sorts of questions, this is something that's relevant for us as a sector and the standards don't give us guidance. And then the last two are really important. How do we define the reporting entity? When we've got joint projects, when we've got a lot of control, whether maybe is the, and this is the same with the act, acting on behalf of another entity, it's very similar. Are you acting as an agent on behalf of somebody else? Are you acting on your own behalf? What if I'm a branch? Am I a reporting entity? Uh, you know, so we had to looking at some of the principles that would help uh, decide which parts or of an organization uh, should report and what should be consolidated or not. So that's the kind of um, overview, if you like. As you can see, these issues are a bit more technical in nature. So we won't go through every single one now. I won't go through any of them now. Um, but what we will do is we'll hold webinars on each one of these issues. So you can do a deeper dive. We'll have some explainer videos. Uh, that give a bit more uh, deep dive into each of those topics uh, so that when you share your views you're kind of confident of what's being presented. So hopefully that look at part one and part two has made you think wow I would like to share my opinions and my perspective. So the only question left is how. <laughs> so we'll be working to make it as easy as possible to share your views. Um, the first thing is you don't have have to respond to all of it. Uh, you can respond to just part one or part two or just one section or one. Um, there's the option to respond to the bits that are relevant and you have an opinion on. But I think uh, there'll be, we're, doing, we're looking at surveys, we're looking at template Word documents, we're looking at different ways on the web where it can be easy to interact with different sections of the document. Um, but when we do launch next year, we'll be, uh, have some videos uh, to go along with it that make it really clear exactly how to respond. And the website will also have links to download different sections um, where you can submit your responses. So also in the middle of next year, we plan to hold uh, round tables. Now it says on the slide country level round tables, but we discussed just last week, we're thinking we might have more like 13 regional round tables that will be online. Um, so there'll be one for West Africa, 
Um, mind you, there might be one for West, French speaking West Africa and one for English speaking. I don't know, we'll have to look. We'll, we'll work with Tomito Pay to see what works uh, in terms of making it easy for people to engage. Um, where we'll ha basically have the chance to have a, more of a meeting and a discussion uh, on the different issues as well. But the main point will be the website. That will be the main way to uh, engage with this consultation process. So part one, the, the uh, consultation will be open until July. And then for part two, it will be open until September because there's just a bit more content and it's a bit more, more in, engaged. So that's the plan. And so if you've signed up for um, project newsletters, if you haven't, do that now. If you've signed up for the newsletter, you will get an email or a notification telling you that the consultation process is launched, it's open, uh, please come and, and submit. So 28th of January is the big date, and there'll be a video that comes out, and we'll have it, we will, you won't miss it, hopefully, especially if you've signed up. So that will be the time to start getting ready to, uh, to participate. The single most important message we'd like you to go away with from this whole meeting is please respond to this consultation process. Register on the newsletter so that you get notified and please share your voice. This is a really wonderful opportunity to shape the future uh, and your voice and your opinion, your perspective really matters.